Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, in honor of the release of the Ridley Scott epic on Napoleon, which is today, if you're watching this on the day that this video comes out, uh, we are going to take a look at some more of the story of Napoleon Bonaparte. And we're going to take a look uh, using the channel Biographics, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte Strategic Genius. Uh, I've been reading all I can about Napoleon so that I am well prepared and educated going into the movie, which I will be watching uh, on release day, which is today. For those of you watching, it's tomorrow for me recording. But uh, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to William and Kevin Ireland. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. And those of you at any level on Patreon or as members here on YouTube can see my next day's reaction video today. Uh, so when this one goes live to the public, you'll be able to see tomorrow's video as well. So just a small way to say thank you for your support. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. As always, the link is in the description uh, so you can check it out without my commentary. He is remembered as a military genius, a tactician without peer. At the age of 35, having just crowned himself the first emperor of France, he set about conquering all of Europe. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte, and above all, he was a master propagandist. He made use of his extraordinary way with words to publish political manifestos, newspapers, and later his autobiography. He regularly commissioned portraits and sculptures, and was acutely aware of how to present himself in the yeah. best light. Even when he made moves to crown himself emperor, he used propaganda and political nous to convince the populace that it was their idea. Napoleon has aroused one of two emotions, hatred or loyalty. Everything around him seemed bigger than life, yet he had none of the physical traits that we associate with power. He was short at five foot two, had extremely pale. Was not five foot two. I don't know where they got that from, but he was closer to five seven, five six, five seven. Definitely wasn't five two. Skin, small, delicate hands, and a large head set on a short, stout neck. Despite this, his inner self-belief projected the aura of invincibility that made him a natural leader of men. It led him to the dizzying heights of victory and the crushing despair of defeat. In this week's Biographics, we discover the real Napoleon Bonaparte. So I will say this, uh, going into this, I don't know exactly how much they're going to cover. Obviously, you can't cover one of the most consequential lives in human history in 20 minutes and do it justice. Neither can you do it in a two and a half hour movie. So I get that. Uh, I will say this, as I have been working my way through a few biographies of him, my opinion of him is growing increasingly positive. And I know that's going to rile some people up on here because we've got uh, a small collection of folks here on the channel who are diehard Napoleon haters who think that he is a tyrant on level with the man with the silly mustache or the guy uh, who changed his name to Joe Steele in the Soviet Union, people like that. He's not. Listen, he is not. You do not compare them in terms of their impact on the people that they conquered and ruled. No comparison whatsoever. You can call him a dictator if you want to. You can see him negatively if you want to, but do not put him on that level at all. In the spring of 1769, the tiny island nation of Corsica was under siege. A hardy band of Corsican patriots were determined to repel the French army that had invaded their lands. They never stood a chance, though. After a year of fighting, death, and carnage, the rebels were defeated. The survivors trudged through the mountains back to their homes. Among them was Letizia and Carlo Bonaparte. Letizia was six months pregnant. It was the day of the Feast of Assumption. And it was Bonaparte at the time. They were Corsican, uh, which historically has ties to Italy and their family going back was Italian. It was an Italian minor noble family. So uh, he's Corsican, but he's also definitely ethnically Italian. Uh, but of course, this is a very unique time in history where Corsica is going from being more associated with Italy to being more associated with France. 
adoption on August 15, 1769, when Letizia gave birth to a second child, and he was named Napoleon. Napoleon's father gave up the flag of Corsican independence once French victory was assured. He refused to fight on in the mountains with his former patriot holdouts. The 23-year-old university student ingratiated himself to the French overlords and quickly took on the trappings yep. of French privilege. It was something that his second son would never forgive him for, viewing his father as a traitor who had betrayed his countrymen. Carlo True, and Napoleon starts out as a pretty ardent Corsican nationalist, but at some point he has a change of heart, probably when he realizes that that change of heart would benefit him personally. He then entered upon a law practice. Before long, he had won election to the Corsican Assembly. He became accepted among the elite of Corsican society and was viewed with favor by the French rulers. Yet, the more successful he became, the more it drove a wedge between him and his second son. In contrast to how he viewed his father, the young Napoleon simply adored his mother. Letizia was a strong-willed, hardy woman. Of her 13 pregnancies, she ended up with eight children. A harsh disciplinarian, she would tolerate no nonsense. Yet Napoleon would later reminisce that all of his success in life was due to the training that he had received at his mother's knee. Which is fascinating to me because uh, for all of his great reforms that I think were very, very positive that Napoleon is going to bring to, to France. And this is something that doesn't get talked about enough because all we focus on are Napoleon's military victories and his conquests and, and all of that stuff. But when Napoleon becomes first consul, when he first comes to significant power in France, he institutes a number of reforms that are very, very positive for the country and that many of which last to this day. Uh, but one of the things he definitely was not in favor of, of was any kind of equality for women. He very much viewed education and advancement and society as being a man's thing and a woman's place was at home, raising a family, being a wife, being a mother. Napoleon set foot on the French mainland for the first time in the winter of 1778, his father having secured him a position at the prestigious Royal Military College at Brienne in northern France. Napoleon, though, he hated it. Accustomed to the warmth of the Mediterranean, the harsh climate shivered him to the bone. To top it off, the skinny, uncoordinated country boy could hardly speak any French. Any one of the facts that he was a scholarship boy and a country bumpkin and a loyal Corsican with a strange accent would have been enough to make the bullies target him. Yet That's something we have to remember. He was not natively French and he didn't speak the language, but he picked it up pretty quickly, as kids do. Kids tend to be really good when it comes to learning a new language, much so, more so than adults are. Somehow, but Napoleon always spoke with an accustomed accent. himself to life at Brienne. His stubbornness and tough exterior made him immune to the taunts of his more privileged classmates. Soon they, along with his teachers, lost interest in the sullen, always serious Bonaparte. Napoleon, he became a loner. At the age of 16, Napoleon began his military apprenticeship as a second lieutenant, training with the country's most elite artillery unit. He learned his trade well and developed into a skilled handler of arms as well as a capable handler of men. Yet and people even at this time recognize, and this is true in a lot of cases, I think of Ulysses S. Grant the same way, right? A guy who kind of rises from very little, uh, but people who knew him even at a young age could see greatness in him. And I think Napoleon's the same way. Uh, even though he's this outsider, he's this foreigner, he's this kid with an accent who's not really French, uh, there were people who saw greatness in him pretty early on. The advancement that he had mapped out for himself was slow in coming. He soon realized that hard work and application were not enough to forge a stellar military career. Position and money. They also played their part, mm -hmm. and he had neither. By his late teens, Napoleon found himself in a state of frustrated inertia. He knew that he was destined for great things, yet nothing was happening for him. So and this is a, a, an excellent point to look at history in general, right? Because if Napoleon had lived in some other part of history, right? If he had, say, lived in this exact part of history... But 50 years earlier, right, if he had been a Corsican who came to France to study in the military school in 1720, we may never have heard of Napoleon Bonaparte. He would have been one more kind of middling French officer who never really did anything of note. The fact that he happens to be in the right place at the exact right time where he's going to have these opportunities 
changes everything. Same thing you could say for Alexander Hamilton. If Alexander Hamilton had been some kid from the Caribbean who was sent to America to go to school and it had happened uh, 50 years later or 50 years earlier than it did, maybe we never hear of him. Simply, he was bored to death. What Napoleon needed was a cataclysmic event that would upend the existing yep. order and present him with the opportunity to grab hold of and shape the future. Little did he know, though, that this was waiting just around the corner. Right place, right time, right person. All of it. On July the 14th, 1789, Paris erupted in revolution. The spark that unleashed the revolution in all its fury occurred when a crowd took over an armory called Hotel de Invalides. They grabbed its weapons and stormed the Bastille prison in search of powder and shot. Napoleon's buried there. Just saying. Word spread of the crowd's success and uprisings began all over France. Granaries and manor houses, they were overrun. The country was in great turmoil. 20-year-old Napoleon was far from Paris when revolution broke forth. Though not a revolutionary himself, he welcomed the revolt, which was shaking the system of privileges which he so despised. After all, it was this very system that prevented him from achieving the advancement of rank that he felt was due to him. Right, he's all about meritocracy, right? right you know, if you're a guy who doesn't have position or title on your own, but you feel that you're very able then what do you want? You want a system in which ability matters more than birthright. So obviously he's going to lean to that side. When the French Republic was declared in the fall of 1792, the ambitious Corsican, he wanted to play a part. Formulating a plan, he took a leave of absence from the army and returned to Corsica, which was now a part of France. He and he did this several times early on in his military career. He spent more time away from the army than he did in the army. And it, had it not been for a couple of... Um, very favorable uh, people that ended up on his side, he could have found himself on the outside looking in and out of the army altogether. Intent on entering local politics and rising through the ranks until he could yep. assert his influence on the national in Corsica. stage. The Corsican government. He wanted to be influential in Corsica. He wasn't thinking about running France at this point. However, rebuffed Napoleon, calling him a big, inexperienced boy. Napoleon reacted to this by setting up a power base to oppose the governor. He yep. attracted a following of young impetus cronies, but the establishment proved too strong for him. Napoleon was forced to flee to the mountains. He and this is the time in which he's going to shift from being a Corsican nationalist to being much more French in his sentiments. His entire family were labeled traitors and enemies of the fatherland. Setting sail for France in June of 1793, Napoleon was tougher, more steely-eyed, and more hard-skinned as a result of his unhappy experience in Corsica. The experience also caused a mental displacement. No longer a Corsican, well, yep. he is now thoroughly French. That 100%. France, however, well, that was going to have to be molded to make it worthy of him. Napoleon returned to the army as an artillery captain. He was quickly ordered to Toulon, a city of 28,000 which had broken into open rebellion. The citizens of this southern port had thrown their port open to the British. It was the French artillery's job to prevent the British from gaining a foothold and to subjugate the rebels. The problem was that the British were... And so right off the bat, who's Napoleon's first great enemy? It's the British. And that's going to kind of be the case all throughout his life now but defending the city from their ship's cannons. Napoleon knew that he had been presented with the opportunity that could transform his yep. destiny. Aristocratic officers had fled France, leaving a vacuum that Napoleon was all too eager to fill. All he had to do was simply prove himself. On his commands, guns and supplies were rushed in from Provence, and his gunners were taught to man them. The regular infantry were intensely retrained under Bonaparte's direct supervision. He also began to display... So think about this, as I said earlier, here is the right situation at the right time, but he's just an artillery captain. He's a low-ranking guy. He's not anybody of any great importance. But he's placed into this situation where he's going to be able to use his knowledge and his expertise. He's going to be able to show the higher-ups that he knows what he's doing. And he's going to basically drag himself from obscurity to the heights of fame almost overnight the flashes of charisma which would forge an unbreakable loyalty within his ranks. 
On December the 17th, he personally led the assault of Fort Aiguille. His bravery and cunning were immediately apparent. Throwing himself into the fray, he fought with fury. Unlike most commanders, Napoleon led from the front. A horse was shot out from under him, and an enemy bayonet slashed him in the thigh. Yet he continued to attack, and his forces quickly overcame the resistance. Within hours, ten British ships had been destroyed, and those that remained were in retreat. The local people, they were then subjugated. It was a stunning victory for Napoleon, and one that led to his promotion to Brigadier General. In the spring of 1795, Napoleon visited Paris, his ambition burning brighter than ever. While there, he was charged with subjugating the Parisian mobs by any means necessary. Again, now he's a Brigadier General, but he's still just one of a bunch, right? He's still not anybody of, like, great significance. But again, right place, right time, perfect kind of synergy of circumstances and opportunity and napoleon is going to make the most of this situation he jumped at the opportunity grabbing cannons and muskets in order to equip his poorly armed forces he set his guns up inside the tuileries in positions that made it impregnable when the attack came napoleon commanded his men to unleash a merciless hail of fire upon them waiting until he could see the whites of their eyes he sent a barrage of grape shot that decimated the parisian mob the enemy attacked us we killed a great many of them now all is quiet i could not be happier napoleon wrote to his brother Napoleon was triumphant. Interesting thing that they mention there, he writes to his brother. I'm assuming this was probably a letter written to Joseph. Uh, Napoleon and his brother Joseph were always very close. He was, he was close to all of his family. Uh, and we see that by the fact that he puts them on significant positions of authority later on. Uh, but even in his rise to power, his brothers like Joseph and Lucien are going to become very important in having the right connections in the right places. But uh, Napoleon is a prolific letter writer. And one of the books that I'm going through right now, which is called Napoleon, A Life, and it's fantastic, by the way, um, uses as one of its primary sources something like 30,000 letters that we have in existence that Napoleon wrote that exist to this day. I mean, it's an amazing resource that we have all of these letters to this day, and it gives such incredible insight into the man and into his relationships with the people who are closest to him. Within a month, he had been made a full general. At just 26 years of age, he was the commander of the Army of the Interior. As a reward for his success against the Parisian mobs, Napoleon was given command of the French army in Italy. There, he was charged with defeating France's enemies, the Austrians, along. Now, we should mention here that this is also where he's going to marry Napole or marry Josephine, who's older than him and uh, who very nearly had died during the French Revolution. It was timing that probably saved her. Her husband was beheaded uh, at the guillotine, and she probably would have been too. She was actually in prison if things hadn't come to an end and Robespierre's downfall happens while she's still in prison. Uh, but he marries her, and right almost identical in time to when he marries her, he gets command of the Army of Italy. She gave him some political connections he didn't otherwise have. Uh, and I, my understanding is this movie that's coming out about Napoleon focuses very heavily on his relationship with Josephine along with their Italian allies and pushed them back over the Alps. This was his first opportunity to fight on foreign soil, and Napoleon was determined to capitalize on this. Prior to his arrival, Napoleon's generals had already written him off as a no-account yep. upstart with illusions of grandeur. When Bonaparte Think arrived, about it. You're some 50, 60-year-old general who has spent your entire career in the French army trying to rise up the ranks. And this 20-something Corsican who doesn't even f speak French without an accent, is going to come in, who's risen from captain of artillery up to command of the Army of Italy in a couple of years, is going to come in and tell us what to do? I don't think so. But he very quickly wins most of them over by his skill on the battlefield and also his command and his connection with his troops. Remember, this is a guy that didn't just lead because he had great strategy and great tactics, he also led because of his personal charisma and his ability to get the most out of his men. 
arrived in the flesh, his generals quickly realized their mistake. Yep. They had vastly underestimated their new commander. He quickly put them in their place. For nearly two years, their incompetence had seen the French forces stagnating in the Alps with nothing to show for it but a general sense of apathy and discontent. As the generals bit their lips, Napoleon addressed the troops. Soldiers, you are naked and ill-fed. No fame shines upon you. I will lead you into the most fertile plains in the world. Rich provinces and great cities will lie in your power. You will find their honor, glory, and riches. Yeah, remember, this is an army, the army of Italy, that's poorly equipped, that's poorly fed, that's poorly led. And over and over again, Napoleon's going to take this very poor army and make great things happen out of it. The men were enraptured by their new leader. Smiling and laughing in the midst, he was unlike anything they had ever seen before. Yep. He picked up their spirits and made them believe in themselves. Infusing them with passion, he began molding them into a formidable fighting force. Meanwhile, the other European powers had become very nervous about what was going on in France. The execution of their king and queen led to the fears that the French experiment in democracy would spread and threaten their own kingdoms. This led Let's please keep this in mind when we're talking about Napoleon, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about Napoleon a lot in the coming weeks just because of the movie. Uh, m most of the wars that Napoleon fought were started by somebody else. Okay, he, This is not a guy who fought all of these wars because he decided he wanted to conquer Italy and Austria and Germany and all these places. These are wars started by somebody else. And in fact, when Napoleon first comes to real power in France, he immediately tries to end these wars. But they didn't want to end the wars because... The French Revolution was a threat to the monarchies of Europe. And so countries like the UK did not want peace with France. The only peace with France they were willing to accept was one in which France restored the Bourbons to the throne of France. And they weren't going to do that. So let's not put all of these Napoleonic wars on Napoleon led them to quickly move against the new French government. This led to a series of wars between France and most of the major European powers. Not Napoleon France's fault. his army into the most efficient conquering force on the European mainland. Over the next three years, he brought stunning victories, not only in Italy, but as far as Austria and parts of North Africa. His North African invasion force was actually a move against Britain, which used Egypt as a trading route. Yep. Though he failed to bring Egypt under control, Napoleon was greeted as a hero on his return to Paris in 1799. Yet he found a nation in turmoil. The government had no money, the Austrians and the Russians were threatening to invade, and some people even wanted to bring back the royal family. Yeah, he comes into a situation where you've got this directory that's running France, and they're on the verge of collapse. They're going to lose the country. Uh, and so, again, where you have this coup that's going to put Napoleon in power, it's really out of necessity, out of a out of a view that there's a power vacuum. And if something drastic doesn't happen, everything that the French Revolution stood for is going to collapse. And so you could argue, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a, a great deal of uh, uh, desire for power on Napoleon's part, but he also saw the situation and felt he was in best position to do something about it. Rumors were flying of a coup. With the people and the army behind him, Napoleon took charge of the Grand Assembly, installing a new government that was to be headed by three provisional consuls. One of these three men was Napoleon Bonaparte himself, and it was he who everyone knew was going to wield the power. Yep. Immediately, Napoleon took control. He sidelined the other two consuls, personally rewriting the constitution to make himself the first consul. At 30 years of age, Napoleon Bonaparte 30. had risen from his humble Corsican background to become the most powerful man in France. It's really quite remarkable and few things can compare to it, this level of rise to power. And it's not like it was a steady incremental rise to power. It was like big leaps of power. It was captain to brigadier general. It was brigadier general to command of an army. It was command of an army to running the country and writing the new constitution, basically writing all the laws out of nothing. And it was that to emperor all by the time he's in his early 30s.
As the absolute central power in France, Napoleon had inherited a nation that had limped from one failed attempt to replace the rule of monarchy to another. For many people, that's a the- great point. They had tried so many different systems of government, and none of them had really worked. And so, when Napoleon comes along and, and rewrites the the legal code, and I mean. When I say rewrite, he didn't just write a new constitution. I mean the details all the way down to how local governments were done. But he also restores the church, right? He doesn't want the church to have the power it had before the revolution. But he does strike a deal with the pope that allows the church to come back. It's no longer going to be a purely secular society. And so he recognizes the importance of the church and kind of controlling the people. Uh, and giving them what they wanted. And, and, he, and he rewrites the education system and the legal system and all of these things. It's incredible. The conditions they found themselves in at the dawn of the 19th century were worse than before the revolution. They looked to Napoleon to save them from their despair. First, though, he had to save them from the Austrians. The Austrians had regrouped and gained back most of the lands that Napoleon had secured during the Italian campaign. The Archduke, Francis II, was intent on crushing the Corsican usurper who thought he could do Looks a lot like Franz Ferdinand, doesn't it? Yeah, I had to look. That's not Francis II. That's Franz Ferdinand, the guy that gets assassinated in 1914 to start World War I. Do as he pleased. As was his custom, Napoleon decided to take the offensive. In the spring of 1800, he took his 40,000-strong army across the French Alps. It was a harrowing trek, his men dragging field artillery and provisions up steep, snow-covered mountain ranges, which towered to a height of 10,500 feet. Men died en route, and as the Grand Army stumbled through the St. Bernard Pass, they were in a state of utter exhaustion. But the crossing it had made in just six days. The battle was joined on June the 14th, and at the day's end, 7,000 French men lay dead. The Austrians, who had finally retreated from the field of battle, left 14,000 bodies behind. The totally spent Grand Army, they had won again. The Austrians withdrew and early the next year signed a peace treaty with Napoleon. Great Britain was the only country remaining in Napoleon's way. He was simply the supreme ruler of the landmass that was Europe. However, Great Britain had unquestioned command of the seas. And again, if it were up to Napoleon, he would have found peace with Britain and that would have been the end of it. But the British weren't interested in peace. Fabulously rich at this point due to her colonial conquests and boasting the greatest navy in the world, Britain decided it was time to halt the rise of the little general. Britain declared war on France on May the 18th, 1803. And it was at this point that Napoleon decided it was time to invade England. Displaying the laser-like focus that epitomized the man, he stated, All my thoughts are directed towards England. I want only for a favorable wind to plant the imperial eagle on the Tower of London. As it turns out, though, the French invasion of Great Britain never materialized. By September 1805, war with Austria, now fortified by the Russians, was once again a priority. The Grand Army was being rushed from the coast to the heart of the Austrian Empire. Then, on October the 21st, the Royal Navy smashed the combined Spanish-British fleet in the Battle of Trafalgar, leaving the French essentially without a navy. The yep. British, that left them safe for now. On December the 2nd, 1804, Napoleon had crowned himself as the first emperor of the French in a lavish ceremony. In all but name and place, it was just like the coronation of the old kings, but with one telling difference. Napoleon, the controller of his own fate, placed the crown, all 80 jewel-encrusted pounds of it, upon his own head. And as I've mentioned before, this was not something spontaneous. This was planned. And this was something that the Pope was aware was going to happen. He didn't snatch it out of the Pope's hand, much to the horror of the Pope and everyone involved. This had been planned. This had been dictated that it was going to be this way. On December the 2nd, 1805, Napoleon found himself again poised for battle against Austria, this time fortified by Russia. This would prove to be the little general's greatest victory. He deliberately abandoned a strategic position near the town of Austerlitz in the Austrian Empire so that his army, which numbered around 68,000, would appear vulnerable. He then weakened his right flank so as to lure the 90,000-strong foe into a trap. They left their center open to counterattack, and Napoleon cut their line in two. And this is all about understanding your opponent and understanding what's likely to cause him to react. And he had fought these opponents enough by this point that he understood what would happen if he did that. By 4.30 p.m., the Allies were either dead or far in retreat. The battlefields had simply fallen silent. 
The battle Brilliant of Austerlitz, just like that, was over. What had begun as a great Allied opportunity to finally defeat and destroy Napoleon Bonaparte had ended not only in their defeat, but in catastrophe. The grand victory at Austerlitz was followed up with a 21-day subjugation of Prussia. Over the next five years, victory followed victory, as one by one the European powers bowed to the dictates of Emperor Napoleon. Only one European nation remained to be brought to heel – Russia. Napoleon and a colossal army crossed the Niemen River on June 24, 1812, to intimidate Russia, but it turned out to be the undoing of his empire. The Russians systematically retreated and scorched the earth, which dragged the French deep into their territory. Then, when they did do battle, it was the bloodiest day of Napoleon's career. The French entered Moscow a week later, only to find it evacuated. The retreat ended up being even more costly. Soldiers had insufficient clothing for the freezing temperatures of an early winter, disease devastated the ranks, and Russian forces pursued them all the way. A little over a sixth of the 600,000 men who marched into Russia came home. This was a blow from which the little general would never recover. And but this all started because of Napoleon's policy of trying to deal with the British. If the British had agreed to uh, close to their fighting with Napoleon, none of this happens, right? Or if Trafalgar goes differently and Napoleon had managed to have some kind of a fleet to deal with the British. This all goes differently. By now, the political map of Europe had changed. The British, the Spanish, the Portuguese pushed the French back over the Pyrenees in the Peninsular War. A grand coalition was formed, with the decisive victory coming at the Battle of Leipzig in October of 1813. Known as the Battle of the Nations, it left 38,000 French dead or wounded and 20,000 captured. And here's a situation now where Napoleon mistakenly does not um, admit defeat and acknowledge a ceasefire where he could have at least held on to things. At this point, Napoleon, I think, is falling victim to the sunk cost fallacy, the idea that we have given too much bloodshed, we have fought too hard to just give up a bunch of the territory we've taken. If you'd asked him five or ten years earlier if he was willing to accept less, absolutely, but now he's not willing to accept it. Napoleon escaped, only to find open hostility back in Paris. The Legislative Assembly, the Senate, and even his own generals turned on him. He had no choice but to abdicate, which he did on April 6, 1840. It was 14, agreed that Napoleon would be 40. sent into exile on the Mediterranean island of Elba. After ten months of exile, Napoleon had had enough. Somehow, on the night of February 26, 1815, he managed to sneak past his guards and set sail in a small boat for the mother country. With him were a handful of loyal soldiers. Miraculously, they managed to avoid the British warships. Stepping foot back on French soil, he fixed his sights on Paris and taking back what had been torn from him. After six days, he and his few men were halted by an infantry regiment with strict orders to detain him. Napoleon strode ahead of his followers and stood in their midst. Soldiers, he declared, if there is one among you who wants to kill his general and emperor, here I am. His charisma had done it again. Rather yep. than rush to take him captive, the massed infantry broke into wild applause. Cheers of long live the emperor filled the air. Suddenly, he had an army. As he closed in on Paris, he drew more and more support. In one place after another, troops defected from the royal army and joined the rebel army. The writing? That was on the wall. By the time he arrived in Paris, Louis XVIII had fled. Napoleon was back in command. The people, they welcomed him as a redeemed hero. But at this point, there was no chance. I mean, the coalition that was arrayed against him, had he won the Battle of Waterloo, there would have been another Waterloo and another Waterloo. There was no situation in which Napoleon could win at this point. Across Europe, the Allies were in shock and disbelief. The devil, it had been unchained. They would have to unite one more time to stop him. This time, though, they would have to totally destroy the man so that there was no chance he would come back. Napoleon was declared an outlaw and a disturber of the tranquility of the world. They massed their armies for attack. 
The Great Reckoning it was at hand. It would be delivered on a field of rye and clover just outside of a small Belgian town called Waterloo. On June the 18th, 72,000 French soldiers faced a 68,000-strong Allied force under the Duke of Wellington. While the fighting seemed even, Napoleon made many tactical errors, including launching his Imperial Guard too late. His most fatal error was to wait until midday before ordering his initial attack in order to let the muddy ground dry. I was going to say, it wasn't so, bu so much an error as it was just necessity based on the circumstances because it had rained the night before. I, he didn't prefer to wait that long. This gave the Prussians time to enter the fray later on. They smashed against his right flank and the battle was lost. Four days later, Napoleon abdicated again, but this time there would be no return. He was nope. packed off to the remote British colony of St. Helena. At 46, Napoleon was simply a man without a future. The man 46, was that's how old I am. And his whole life is basically played out at that point. Football ambition, the man of action, the man of headlines. He was confined to reading the newspaper and gardening. He died on May the 5th, 1821, most likely from stomach cancer. Days before, when he knew his time was up, he had whispered to one of his guards, to die is nothing, but to live defeated and without glory is mm. to die every day. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode of Bio all right, so uh, obviously that's just a really quick overview for those who maybe aren't real familiar with Napoleon's story. Uh, definitely planning on checking out the movie, and I will be bringing you a review of the movie uh, once I've seen it and I have a couple of days to d digest it and kind of think through it a little bit. I'll definitely be letting you know my thoughts about it. I want to give a shout-out to Jake from Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, and Raul from Carbon in Germany and Deutschland. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Really appreciate it. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.